Well, can you believe it? Lecture 20, the last lecture of the course. We're going to close up with photosynthesis, which is essentially the story of glucose metabolism backwards. This is going to be a two-part lecture series, three chunks in the first lecture and two chunks in the second. So this is chunk A of lecture 19. And this is the first half of chapter 22. So let's get started. In this first half of photosynthesis, we will talk about the structure and function of the site of photosynthesis, which of course is the chloroplast plast organelle that we find in all photosynthetic plant cells. In the second chunk, we'll talk about these photosystem protein complexes, photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. And these are the sites of the light reactions where water is split into oxygen and energy. That'll lead us into the first phases of photosynthesis itself and ATP production. And we'll take a little bit of a detour at the end of this lecture and talk about photosynthesis without oxygen um, and how that might work in some more primitive cells. But let's start somewhere where we're all very, very comfortable. The general notion of photosynthesis. As all of us know, probably from high school courses, if not even earlier, plants take in carbon dioxide and water, and they release oxygen while making food for themselves. That's the general nuts and bolts explanation of photosynthesis. What we exhale, carbon dioxide, plants take in, they take in water as well and energy from the sun, and they break all that down into oxygen as a waste product, which we then use, of course, and um, glucose and food for themselves. So uh, when plants do photosynthesis, they're not doing it to make oxygen for us, the oxygen that we use as the ultimate electron carrier. Uh, plants have no business helping us, and they have no interest in helping us. They're trying to help themselves. What they're doing is making food for themselves. And actually, if we want to get a little bit more biochemical about it, what's going on to the carbon dioxide that plants are taking in is that they are fixing it. Remember, we talked about nitrogen fixation in an earlier lecture, and that meant getting nitrogen out of the air and putting it into more organic molecules. We mean the same thing here with carbon. Carbon dioxide is drawn out from the air and put into more organic carbon-containing molecules, most notably carbohydrates or sugars. Each carbon from each carbon dioxide molecule that a plant takes in is used as a single carbon in a chain of carbons that will ultimately become hydrated carbons or carbohydrates, sugars. And it's these sugars that plants make through photosynthesis that they live off of. They actually metabolize those sugars the exact same way we do, ironically enough. So here's the most basic and general formula for photosynthesis. A plant will take in six molecules of carbon dioxide, six molecules of water, they will use those six water molecules to hydrate each of those six carbons, creating the carbohydrate or carbohydrate sugar glucose here. And the remaining six oxygen molecules are released as waste, luckily for us, because we need those oxygens to accept the final electrons of the electron transport chain. So this equation, as simple as it is, it actually represents two very complicated biochemical processes. First are the light reactions, which we're covering here in lecture 19. This is the oxidation of water to oxygen and electrons, high-powered electrons, and the dark reactions. The dark reactions are the carbon fixation reactions, where carbon dioxide is fixed and hydrated to yield glucose, to yield sugar. So schematically, we can represent those two phases of photosynthesis in this way. Here is the chloroplast, uh, the photosynthetic organelle of plants. In the light reactions, those chloroplasts absorb light radiation energy and use it to split water into oxygen, which is released, and protons and electrons, which are harvested. And then those protons and electrons, the energy from those electrons, are combined with carbon dioxide in the dark reactions to yield glucose sugar. So we'll follow photosynthesis in this order and start with the light reactions. The dark reactions is what we'll discuss in that final lecture number 20. So this process obviously requires sunlight. That's why it's called the light reactions. It is the radiation energy from sunlight that is used directly to oxidize water to oxygen. And we're still using that term oxidize in the same way. All we mean here is that sunlight energy is going to be used to strip electrons from water. And where the electrons go, the protons follow. So we release protons as well. And what we're left with after we re release protons and electrons from water is the oxygen that will be released. It's the electrons that we're after, though. It's the electrons that the plants need. Incidentally, at the very end of glucose metabolism, the end of the electron transport chain, what is it that we did? What is it that we reduced? 
we reduced oxygen to yield water. That's what complex four did for us in the electron transport chain. So already we're talking about photosynthesis being the opposite of glucose metabolism. The very, very first step of photosynthesis, oxidizing water to oxygen, is the same or opposite of the very, very last step of the electron transport chain where oxygen was reduced to water. The energy from the sun is absorbed by chlorophyll directly. That's a photosynthetic pigment that absorbs light energy, and it's chlorophyll that drives the light reactions forward. The light reactions, as I've already told you, yield electrons, high power electrons, and those electrons are carried by NADPH. You might remember we've discussed NADP quite a few times now at this point in the course, and NADP is always our specialized super high energy electron carrier, and such is the case here as well. These electrons from water are so high energy that we need NADP to carry them. Uh, this NADPH will be used in the dark reactions as a potent reducing agent by giving those electrons off to other things. They'll also be transferring energy to those other things in the dark reaction and it's that energy that will be used to make glucose. We'll also need energy in the form of ATP for the dark reactions as well. The dark reactions are very energy intensive. So if all of this is happening in the chloroplasts, let's be very comfortable and confident with what the chloroplast actually looks like. In photosynthetic prokaryotes, in bacterial cells that can make their own energy, photosynthesis occurs in small granules that are bound to the cell membrane. Remember, no organelles in prokaryotes. But in photosynthetic eukaryotes, such as normal green plants and algae, all of that photosynthesis occurs in the chloroplast. Chloroplasts are believed to derive from the same place mitochondria have. Chloroplasts have their own genome, they have their own DNA, and they believe to be the remnants of an engulfed um, photosynthetic prokaryote that was eaten a long time ago by a proto-eukaryotic cell. So here it is in all its glory, a plant chlorophyll, a, a chloroplast with chlorophyll in it. Uh, again, the organelle where photosynthesis occurs, and we can appreciate right away that the structure of a chloroplast is far more intricate and involved than a mitochondria that we've seen before. Uh, yes, it's membrane bound, much like a mitochondria is, so we see some parallels there as well. Also, chloroplasts have an inner and outer membrane, just as mitochondria do. They even have an inner membrane space, but that outer membrane is shown here in green, and the inner membrane is shown here in orange. And the inner membrane space is this very thin void between these two membranes. You might see that where we would have the matrix of the mitochondria, there's a whole lot more going on inside the chloroplast. And let's break these structures down. Chloroplasts contain in their center grana. These grana are these flattened disks of membrane that we see here. Grana is the plural. So you are looking at here a stack of one, two, three, four, five, six grana. Each individual flattened disk is a granum. These flattened disks can also be called thylakoid disks, and so these thylakoid disks are stacked together to form a grana. These grana are connected to one another by intergranal lamellae. These are these connective tissues, these connective membranes between the individual stacks. That is not a term I will ever ask you to know again. And because these thylakoid discs, these individual granum of these thylakoid discs are hollow, we have an even deeper area of the chloroplast that we never encountered in the mitochondria. And that is called the thylakoid space. So let's start in the most interior portion of a chloroplast and work our way out. Let's have this chloroplast structure make the most sense in that way. The most inside you can ever get inside a chloroplast is the thylakoid space, the hollow area within a single thylakoid disc. Many, many thylakoid discs stacked together make a granum. Granum are connected to one another by integranal lamellae and all of these stacks taken together are grana. The empty space outside the grana, enclosed by the inner mitochondrial membrane, is referred to as the stroma 
of the chloroplast. So all this dark void space that you see here and here and here, this is all stroma. Surrounding all that stroma is the inner mitochondrial membrane. Then you have the inner mitochondrial space leading to the outer membrane of the chloroplast. So there is a lot of structure, intricate structure, within the chloroplast itself. The trapping of light energy, the production of oxygen, the oxidation of water, all of that, all of the light reactions occurs within the thylakoid discs themselves, both in that thylakoid space as well as with proteins associated with the thylakoid membrane. The fixing of carbon dioxide into sugars, of using all that energy and fixing that energy um, into carbon dioxide to build carbohydrates, essentially the dark reactions, all of that occurs in the stroma, the space outside of the thylakoid discs but still contained within the inner mitochondrial membrane. So when we think photosynthesis, we think the trapping of light energy, the absorption of light by chlorophyll. So let's start with that very comfortable place, something that we're all familiar with already. This is the primary and defining event of photosynthesis in general, and so this is where we'll start. Light energy, when absorbed by chlorophyll, excites the electrons in chlorophyll and causes chlorophyll molecules to reach a high energy state. Because chlorophyll was in a low energy state before light hit it, and light hitting chlorophyll bumps it up to a high energy state, we have essentially just trapped light energy in the excited high energy state of chlorophyll. That energy can then be transferred from chlorophyll molecule to chlorophyll molecule and eventually be used to do lots of things. Maybe it's used to make ATP, maybe it's used to oxidize water, maybe it's eventually and ultimately used to build carbohydrates. So essentially what photosynthesis is doing is it's taking light energy and converting it into chemical energy. It's taking the radiation energy of light and using that to make glucose and ATP, chemical energy. Chlorophyll as a molecule has a very long hydrophobic chain. This is the hydrophobic chain that we're talking about. Here is the nuts and bolts of the chlorophyll molecule. For those of you who are familiar with the overall structure of heme, uh, heme which is coordinated within hemoglobin, you can see that both heme and chlorophyll look very much the same. Uh, we have a coordinated iron in the center of heme. That's the iron that we have in our blood. Here we see it's a magnesium. But the overall shape of these two molecules are essentially, um, well, not identical, but they're very, very similar. But heme does not have this long hydrophobic tail. This long hydrophobic tail of chlorophyll allows chlorophyll to embed within the thylakoid membrane directly. So chlorophyll is embedded in the membrane of the thylakoid discs. The hydrophobic tail makes favorable hydrophobic interactions with the membrane lipids of the thylakoid membrane. And there are different individual types of chlorophyll, each specialized in the different wavelength of light that it most absorbs. Chlorophyll A tends to absorb most light in the red and orange and a little bit of the yellow spectrum. And chlorophyll B prefers the deeper colors, such as the blues and the violets. The one color that you see not absorbed by chlorophyll is green. And this is why plants appear to be green to us. This is kind of a... a um, little bit of a paradox. If we were to be asked at first blush, well, what wavelength of light do plants absorb? You would probably think green, because that's what they are. Green plants absorb green light. But actually, the opposite is true. When white light hits a plant, the blues and violets are absorbed and don't bounce off the plant. The reds and oranges and some of the yellows are absorbed and don't bounce off of the plant. In fact, the only wavelength of that white light that does not get absorbed by the plant and bounces back to hit our own retina is the green wavelength. So plants appear to be green to us because that is the one wavelength of light they are not absorbing. Things that appear black to us absorb all wavelengths. Things that appear white to us reflect all wavelengths, and plants reflect green light. That's why they look green to us. So chlorophyll actually does a very good job of absorbing most of the visible light spectrum. Only the greens tend to be bounced back. And more absorbed light means more absorbed energy, and more absorbed energy means more efficient production of glucose. And I just told you why plants are green. 
Plants also contain what are called accessory pigments. These do a pretty good job of absorbing a lot of the other wavelengths of light too. So essentially plants, uh, chloroplasts in, in particular, are very, very good at absorbing light energy and they should be. That's their primary source of food. So when this light energy is absorbed, it is either absorbed directly by or quickly transferred directly to chlorophyll. And as good as all this light absorption is, let's back up a second and just remember where we are. We're talking about green plants. More specifically, we're talking about cellular processes that occur within the cells of green plants. More specifically still, we're talking about what's occurring in the chloroplasts of those green plants and more specific still still we're talking about chlorophyll and accessory pigments that are interacting favorably and hydrophobically with the thylakoid membrane here this is a single thylakoid disc with its hollow thylakoid space inside this stack of discs is a granum these many stacks of discs are grana they are floating within the stroma, enclosed by the inner, mito inner chloroplast membrane, all encased by the outer membrane. So we are talking about things that are occurring right here in this thylakoid membrane. We are looking at hydrophobic interactions that are anchoring chlorophyll and accessory pigments in the thylakoid membrane. So I don't want us to forget uh, what it is we're talking about here. Most of the chlorophyll in a chloroplast, most of the chlorophyll that's trapped in a thylakoid membrane is referred to as antenna chlorophyll. Antenna chlorophyll do what all antenna do. They gather things. An antenna on your car gathers radio, radio waves. An antenna on someone's house gathers TV transmissions. And antenna chlorophyll gathers light. Whether part of an antenna chlorophyll complex or part of what we're about to define as photosynthesis, photosystems, all chlorophyll molecules are light absorbing and all chlorophyll molecules are associated with neighboring proteins. Just like heme is bound to hemoglobin, chlorophyll is bound to proteins. These light harvesting antenna chlorophyll pass the energy that they absorbed as this high energy excited state to a specialized, and through the action of proteins, they transfer it to a specialized pair of chlorophyll molecules that together make up a reaction center. And so this is what we can think of as the coating of the thylakoid membrane. I want you to imagine that the thylakoid membrane is underlying everything we're about to talk about. So each of these green molecules is a single chlorophyll embedded into the thylakoid membrane, as I demonstrated before. So we're looking at the coating or the surface of the thylakoid membrane. Light hits this. Light energy hits this. And most of the time, that light energy hits an antenna chlorophyll molecule. That's what's shown here. And that antenna chlorophyll molecule becomes very excited. It goes to a high energy state. And as I just told you here, that energy of excitement, that energy of electrons in higher valence shells is passed from antenna chlorophyll molecule to antenna chlorophyll molecule. It's almost like the energy is passed from chlorophyll to chlorophyll in a game of hot potato. Until sooner or later through this random path, that energy, that light energy, that light energy that is captured now as excited electrons meets a reaction center. Reaction centers are specialized chlorophyll molecules that are spread diffusely and sparingly across the thylakoid membrane. So we can see that in real time here. Light hits an antenna chlorophyll molecule. Those excited electrons are quickly passed from chlorophyll to chlorophyll. Randomly, they find their way until they collide with a reaction center. A reaction center is just specialized chlorophyll where something unique and different is going to happen. So when this energy from the sun eventually collides with the reaction center, this is where the chemical reactions of the light reactions of photosynthesis can occur. In a typical chloroplast, there are hundreds and hundreds of light harvesting antenna chlorophyll for every single reaction center present. So again, they are diffusely spread out across the thylakoid membrane and they are relatively rare. How and why photosynthesis works in this way is not completely understood, but we do know that this is the way it works. 
So we're going to leave it here for the first chunk. We'll be moving on to what actually occurs at those reaction centers in the next chunk, and we'll get at the, the meat and potatoes of the light reactions there as well. But to summarize what we talked about here, we talked about photosynthesis really breaking down to uh, isolating carbons from carbon dioxide, hydrating those carbons so that they're fixed as carbohydrates, glucose, and then the plant living off of that glucose. The source of the electrons needed for that carbon fixation is water. Water is oxidized to its electrons and protons, which the plant will use, and oxygen, which is released as a waste product for us to breathe in. And that's essentially the outcome of the light reactions. The light reactions are going to produce for us some ATP, but mostly electrons and protons. In the dark reactions, we'll then take the energy of those electrons and use them to fix carbon dioxide into hydrated carbons, glucose. The energy from the sun is directly absorbed by chlorophyll molecules, most importantly antenna chlorophyll molecules, that are embedded within and coat the thylakoid membrane. And it's this uh, absorbed sun energy that will be used for the light reactions of chloroplasts. We went over the detailed structure of a chloroplast, starting with the thylakoid space, out to thylakoid discs, then to individual stacks of grana, and then the many uh, granum, and then the many, many grama, grana. We talked about the stroma space, the inner, the inner chloroplast membrane, the uh, inner membrane space, and then the outer membrane of the chloroplast. And then we went into the actual uh, light absorption process a bit more, where light hits antenna chlorophyll, excites that antenna chlorophyll into a, a higher energy state. That energy is then passed from chlorophyll to chlorophyll until eventually it's going to collide with a reaction center. And here is where we leave it for chunk two. What happens once that energy makes it to a reaction center? What do these specialized chlorophyll molecules and the proteins they're associated with actually do? And that's what we will talk about in the next lecture chunk, uh, lecture chunk B.